Good afternoon. It is my pleasure to welcome you to today's webinar on bringing nature into green growth policymaking in Africa. My name is John Mon. I manage the research program at the Green Growth Knowledge Platform, GGKP. GGKP is a global community of experts and institutions committed to collaboratively generating, managing, and sharing green growth knowledge and data. The GGKP is all about partnership. It was established just a few years ago by four founding partners, UN Environment, the World Bank, the OECD, and the Global Green Growth Institute, or GGGI. The GGKP is now a partnership of over 55 organizations, representing policymakers and experts in countries all over the world. And today in particular, we have the opportunity to hear from three experts operating at the cutting edge of new methods for bringing nature, or as we call it, natural capital, into development planning. Each expert will present a different approach for measuring the value of natural capital in economic activity, as well as some best practices for turning that value into a policy protected resource in three unique countries in East Africa. We encourage you today, the audience, to raise questions and to use the chat box to do so on your screen whether on the right or the left, the chat box. We'll share selected questions with our panelists. And also, please keep an eye out for the post-webinar survey. It takes us less than five minutes to complete, and we'd really appreciate your feedback. We'll be making a video recording of the webinar, which will be available on the GDKP website after the webinar within 24 hours. Please do go ahead and share it with your networks. Also, during the webinar, if you have any technical issues at all, send us an email and we'll try to help you through them. The email is contact at ggkp.org. Once again, that's contact at ggkp.org. GGKP will actually be continuing this discussion after today at GGGI's Global Green Growth Week in Addis Ababa. This is next month on the 17th and 18th of October. GGI's theme this year is Unlocking Africa's Green Growth Potential. The GGKP will be holding a special session on valuing, protecting, and enhancing natural capital in Africa. If you'd like to learn more, it's available online. You can visit ggweek2017.org. Let me say that again. GGG, that's three Gs, ggweek2017.org. We are also sharing a handout with more information about that event. And so now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce to you today's moderator, Dr. Alice Akini Kaudia. Dr. Kaudia has served Kenya as its first environment secretary since 2008. Previously, she was director for the East Africa region of the International Union for Conservation of Nature, or IUCN. She served in several leading positions, advising national governments and global research institutes in Africa. Dr. Kaudia holds a doctorate of philosophy in forestry extension and development from the University of East Anglia in the UK, with strong background, strong experience in the agricultural sector. Dr. Kaudia, I'm quite delighted to welcome you to today's webinar. Uh, thank you, John, and uh, thank you, panelists and participants, for joining us in engaging in this important topic of bringing natural capital to national green growth policy, uh, where we'll be drawing lessons from Africa. This is a topic which is indeed very, very relevant to the situation in Africa, a continent that is heavily endowed with natural resources, uh, forests, soils, bees, oceans, water, bacteria, fungi, and natural gas, minerals as well, but which suffers from uh, persistent poverty and other uh, challenges. It is my pleasure to be your moderator today, and uh, I really look forward to a very successful webinar. 
With your permission, allow me to introduce our panelists. Uh, we have very experienced panelists, three of them, and I will introduce them in the order of uh, by, through which we will listen to them during the presentation. We have uh, Katia Karosakis, who is an environmental economist at the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development. Uh, at that organization, she leads the work on biodiversity and ecosystems. She joined the OECD in 2006 to work on climate change, biodiversity issues, uh, biodiversity and water and the environment. Her area of interest includes the use of economic instruments for biodiversity conservation and sustainable use, biodiversity finance and indicators, valuation and development issues. And prior to that, Katia worked as the US, at the US Environmental Protection Agency on climate change and on emissions trading. She received her PhD from University College London and her master's degree from Duke University. I'm sure you'll be excited to listen to uh, Madame Katia as she uh, leads us in one of the exciting topics during this webinar. We also have with us uh, Stephen King, who is an environmental economist in the, in the UN environment at the World Conservation Monitoring Center. Uh, he has been there since 2014. Stephen is heavily involved in the development of the center's approach to natural capital accounting and formulating proposals to best integrate this approach into national decision making. He also provides economic input into projects and undertake, undertaken within the Ecosystems Assessment Program and elsewhere across the center. Prior to that, Steve worked for nearly 10 years as a senior and a principal consultant in the construction and transport industries, providing advice on <coughs> contaminated land assessment and pollution abatement. Stephen holds a Master's of Science in Environment Economics and a Doctor of Philosophy degree in Management Science from the University of Kent. His, his doctoral thesis discusses non-market valuation of river ecosystem services from improvement in river connectivity. This research was supported by optimization modeling in order to generate the most cost-effective solutions to habitat fragmentation problems. Previous research has also included valuing public uh, access to forests. Our third uh, panelist is uh, Aeon Sinot, uh, who is the director of the Valuing Nature Initiative at the World Wildlife Foundation US. He bridges complex science, business, and political interest to bring the value of natural capital assets upfront in public policy narratives and, pro and private investment. He believes that transformational change is possible. It's a matter of solving real problems for society, nurturing multiple champions to create the space for change and making sure the capacity of actors matches the challenge. He enjoys working with a diverse team of talented change makers across the global uh, WWF network, engaging governments, communities, and businesses to optimize the ecological infrastructure performance together with built infrastructure industries and cities for lasting shared prosperity. Before taking his current role, uh, Eon ran a consulting business engaging with African Development Bank in Mozambique, the WWF's regional office for Africa, uh, Mozambique, and uh, Myanmar. WWF, uh, US, and uh, government. Uh, and there he uh, in involving in creating financing, green economy, and natural capital national policy initiatives. He has quite a broad breadth of experience. He has also worked as a team leader for different UN agencies and the government of Mozambique on projects including micronutrient fortification, urban sustainable uh, energy, and tourism. And from 2003 to 2005, Mr. Sinot managed food security program reaching over a million people for the UN in Zimbabwe. 
He graduated with a BA in Business Economics and Social Studies from Trinity College, Dublin in 2002 and has an MSc in Environmental Management from the School of Oriental and African Studies, University of London in 2010. He gained a certificate in Problem-Driven Iterative Adaptation from the Center for International Development, Harvard University in 2016. Uh, he says he grew up in rural Ireland, speaks three languages, in, and is an avid wave rider and has lived in France, Italy, US, Zimbabwe, and Mozambique. When we talk of wealth of experience, our panelists have it. So I think we are going to benefit a lot. Moving forward, with the, your perm permission, uh, dear participants, allow me now to introduce uh, the first presenter, uh, Katia Karosaki, who will uh, be able to give us a presentation that will enrich our knowledge on methodologies for this natural capital inclusion in green growth policies. Uh, Katia, please, you're welcome. Hello? Me. Hello. Hello, Katia, welcome, please. Thank you. Let me just turn on um, presentation. So do you see, can you see the screen? Does this work? Okay, I'm going to go ahead. So first of all, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Kadia, for the introduction and also to uh, John and the GGKP for the invitation to participate in this webinar. Um, as John mentioned, the OECD is one of the four uh, founding partners of the G GKP, and it's a pleasure uh, to be part of this uh, webinar today to talk about mainstreaming natural capital and green growth in Africa. Um, I just want to highlight that uh, overall, both the UNEP WCMC and the WWF presentations will relate to uh, measurement issues and some sort of background questions uh, to keep in mind as you're listening to the three presentations are, um, how can natural capital measurement and accounting uh, be used for policy making? And also practically, um, what types of policies can countries put in place uh, to balance, for example, infrastructure development needs and natural capital? Um, also bearing in mind uh, a very sort of common um, adage, bearing in mind um, that you cannot manage what you cannot measure. Um, I'd just like to highlight that the OECD's main role is uh, to provide evidence-based policy advice. And uh, the OECD has various strands of work across multiple directorates, a number of which are relevant to green growth and natural capital issues. And uh, during this presentation today, I'll just draw on a few of these strands um, to, that are relevant. And I'd like to begin here with, with, um, with a sort of a, a measurement framework for green growth, a conceptual framework that uh, we use here at the OECD. Uh, we, we realize uh, the need, the urgent need to monitor progress towards green growth. And um, the measurement framework that we use here is uh, one that has identified uh, 26 indicators to capture the main features of green growth and to monitor progress across four main areas. And uh, these four main areas, as you can see on the slide, is environmental and resource productivity of the economy, uh, which you see here uh, in red. Um, such as output generated per unit of natural resources or materials used. The second one is the natural asset base, which is at the bottom in black, um, such as the availability of renewable and non-renewable natural resource stocks. The third one is the environmental dimension of the quality of life, um, here in blue. And finally, the economic opportunities and the policy responses um, listed in orange on the on the right. So the idea is to, in order to be able to uh, monitor progress towards green growth, uh, you need to go through the different um, stages from measurement of natural resource stocks and flows um, to policy making, uh, which really is about how you mainstream um, these issues together. 
In terms of um, the OECD work on green growth, uh, for natural capital in particular, the OECD green growth indicators intend to capture available stocks and also changes over time of natural resources such as freshwater, forests, fish, minerals, land, soil, and wildlife. And at the moment, only about half of these can be populated in a commensurable uh, manner for all the OECD countries and uh, some G20 countries um, and uh, South Africa is included there as well. Uh, the ones that are available at the moment are the ones listed here. Uh, land cover and land use change, forest resources, uh, freshwater endowment and abstraction intensities, and also biodiversity in terms of um, threatened species, um, protected area coverage, etc. These are just some examples. Um, work is also underway now on uh, land and soil resources, and also uh, on developing an index of natural resources in monetary terms to inform on the sustainability of uh, natural resource use. But I'd like to turn now more specifically uh, to some other strands of work uh, that focus on mainstreaming natural capital and biodiversity into green growth and development in Africa. Um, there's um, ongoing work on mainstreaming biodiversity and development overall, which I'll talk about in a moment. Uh, but uh, one of the uh, case studies uh, we, uh, we looked at was how uh, South Africa is uh, mainstreaming biodiversity into their uh, various aspects of their national development planning. Um, so for example, um, in, in one paper, uh, the, the insights from across various sectors um, have been brought together, looking at how biodiversity has been mainstreamed in land use planning and mining in water, um, infrastructure, and agriculture. And what has been core to mainstreaming um, in Africa, in South Africa, excuse me, has been um, spatially explicit uh, biodiversity mapping. So here um, I just summarize uh, some of the barriers and the, the challenges as well as the key ingredients for success um, in the context of South Africa for uh, mainstreaming uh, biodiversity across these uh, different sectors. Um, and just uh, some, some ex I'll just mention one example in terms of uh, the demanding skill set required in mainstreaming natural capital in, in development uh, is, for example, that it requires uh, multidisciplinary um, knowledge, um, technical and institutional knowledge across multiple sectors, um, as well as very strong leadership and interpersonal skills. Um, so as to bridge the, the divide uh, between these different um, areas of expertise and the stakeholders uh, involved in these different areas. Uh, in terms of key ingredients for success, uh, one of the, I'll just again just mention one example, um, good, good science um, has been uh, very important in being able to provide uh, the data and information information needed um, that can be integrated with, for example, land use planning and collaborations according to, uh, in, in respect to that, for example, between um, SANBI, the South African National Biodiversity Institute, and the, and the mapping um, they have developed together with uh, the Western Cape Department of Environmental Affairs and Development Planning uh, to bring the different needs together and to adjust also say uh, the spatial scales of the data to match the um, spatial de development framework um, that is, uh, that is uh, part of the process for, for land use planning in South Africa. Uh, what I would like to turn now is to uh, some other, uh, a broader project which is ongoing at the moment, which is on mainstreaming biodiversity and development. Uh, this work examines insights from 16 uh, countries. These are pro uh, predominantly uh, mega diverse countries, and they include um, Ethiopia, uh, Madagascar, and South Africa. And the types of questions that we're examining in this work is, uh, these are just illustrative, um, to what extent uh, is biodiversity mainstreamed in national development plans, um, in green growth strategies, uh, where these are available, in uh, national sustainable development strategies, etc. Uh, what is the role of data and information? Um, how is biodiversity uh, being mainstreamed also at the sectoral level in uh, key sectors that are dependent on uh, natural resources? 
such as agriculture, forestry, and fisheries. And also, finally, what indicators, if any, are being used uh, to monitor progress on mainstreaming biodiversity in, um, in development in these countries. So just to uh, highlight just a couple of, of, of examples here of things that, that we're, are, we're looking at. Looking at uh, mainstreaming biodiversity uh, in the national development plans, for example, of Ethiopia, Madagascar, and South Africa, we've looked at uh, the extent to which uh, these countries have reflected uh, biodiversity or ecosystems or natural capital in uh, the strategic direction of their national development plans, um, in the actions and targets that are specified uh, within the NDPs, and also if they've established indicators um, against which you can uh, monitor progress over time. So is there a baseline at some point, and then can you can you identify whether progress is being made? Um, so the full circles indicate um, that this that the that there is a strong degree of mainstreaming in these uh, national development plans, uh, with half circle indicating there is some mention of it, but. It, um, not it's not very comprehensive or it's there's mentioned a few times but it doesn't really permeate uh, through the relevant areas in the NDPs or in other areas where um, where indicators for example are, are not yet uh, developed um, I'd also like to just highlight a few examples of indicators in the National Biodiversity Strategies and Action Plans um, that do refer to mainstreaming indicators. Uh, these are some examples across uh, a broader range of countries from that study. Um, just some examples uh, that, are, that are highlighted here is uh, in South Africa, for example, um, under Objective uh, 3 of the National Biodiversity Strategy and Action Plan, um, the objective is to um, ensure that biodiversity considerations are mainstreamed into policies, strategies, and practices of a range of sectors. Um, the, the specific target um, under that is that uh, there's effective science-based biodiversity tools to inform planning and decision-making. And here, for example, I'll just raise the first one, uh, the indicator uh, uh, proposed is the number of tools developed to support mainstreaming of biodiversity assets and ecological infrastructure in production sectors and resource management. Um, and the, the specific uh, target for that is by 2020 that there are 10 new tools produced and 15 knowledge resources demonstrating the value of biodiversity developed and disseminated. Um, you see here a list of other indicators in NBCEPs that relate to mainstreaming biodiversity and green growth and development, such as from Ethiopia, from Vietnam, um, India, um, and, and some other countries. Um, in terms of uh, measurement and, uh, and, and monitoring, um, there are also a broader range of uh, national databases and assessments that are relevant to mainstreaming. And here again are, are just a few examples uh, across a range of countries. Uh, Madagascar, for example, has a national environmental dashboard uh, which generates reports on the status of the environment. Um, and it, it's a tool for decision and research and training activities at the country level. And at the, so it's at the, at the national level, uh, but at the same time, this is uh, being uh, um, brought out um, at the regional level, where at, to, to, at present, 90% uh, of the regions have their own um, dashboards and are updated regularly. In terms of another type of assessment um, that is useful um, to uh, examine the extent to which natural capital and biodiversity is uh, mainstreamed um, throughout green growth and the economy. Uh, I'll just raise the example here of France, uh, one of the, the few countries that has undertaken a national assessment on the public subsidies that are harmful to biodiversity. This allows you to identify what types of uh, government um, support can be harmful at the national level um, and then help you identify and prioritize which ones you need to, um, to address to reform um, and to transition um, in various ways um, so that you can achieve both uh, natural capital um, benefits and development benefits. 
Um, there are, of course, a number of other relevant indicators, databases, and assessments that are relevant to mainstreaming biodiversity and natural capital in development, also based on uh, data collected by various international organizations, whether it's um, UNEP WCMC, FAO, uh, the OECD, World Bank, etc. And uh, part of the objective of our ongoing project on mainstreaming biodiversity uh, and development is to examine indicators that could be used uh, to monitor mainstreaming progress at both national and sector level. So I'll stop there and um, thank you very much. If you're interested, there's further information here in the link to our, to our biodiversity work. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Katia, for that uh, excellent presentation. Uh, when we'll get to the discussion session, you'll appreciate how much many questions we have about methods, methods of measurement, methods of accounting. And uh, I think at this point, uh, allow me, uh, the audience, to now welcome our next uh, presenter, uh, Steve King, who will uh, give us uh, a presentation on experimental ecosystems accounting in Uganda. Steve, most welcome. So, uh, thank you very much uh, for the kind into introduction, uh, Dr. Courier, and I'll just start my presentation now. Uh, so, my presentation will provide uh, a quick overview of a, a project between the National Planning and uh, National Environmental Management Authorities in Uganda, uh, the, World, uh, the Wildlife Conservation Society, uh, ourselves and the IDEA group on compiling experimental ecosystem accounts uh, in Uganda. So this represents accounts for the biotic components of natural capital. So many thanks to uh, the GGKP uh, for bringing this webinar together uh, and providing the opportunity to present this work and I hope you uh, enjoy the presentation. So I'll begin with a quick overview uh, of the uh, presentation, touching on some uh, uh, policy relevance of the accounts uh, we constructed. I'll then introduce uh, some of the data sets we used, how this data was processed, uh, and then present some of the accounting tables and results. Uh, and I'll finish off with some broad insights uh, into the work and some next steps. Uh, and, and at the bottom uh, here, we see the map uh, identifying Uganda. There's a, a link to uh, the full report, which I'm uh, very happy to uh, share further. So the concept of the sustainable use of natural capital and resources in support of green growth and socio-economic development is recognized in the National Development Plan for Uganda, um, as well as the Green Growth Strategy and the National Biodiversity Strategy uh, and Action Plan. And I'll just try to bring out on this slide uh, some key extracts from those uh, policy documents that are, that are highlighted here. Uh, and this has allowed us to identify a set of key policy entry points for natural capital accounts for ecosystems uh, and biodiversity in Uganda. Uh, and from these we developed a, a set of key analytical uses uh, with stakeholders in Uganda. Uh, and this has helped ensure that the, the final accounts were relevant uh, to, to end user needs. So now I'd quickly like to present an overview of the technical uh, approach to demonstrate really that this type of uh, accounting um, is achievable. So the approach we took uh, was spatial uh, and based on using uh, remotely sensed um, information, basically a satellite mapping uh, of land cover to provide a time series of land cover change observations. Uh, from which we could infer implications uh, of these uh, on natural ecosystems, uh, including forests uh, and selected uh, aspects of biodiversity over different time periods. So for Uganda, we have uh, maps of land cover uh, available from 1990, 2005, 2010 uh, and 2015. Uh, and these provide maps of uh, all the uh, different land cover classes that you can see in the middle column of this, this table that's presented here. And so from these, uh, uh, we created aggregations that reflect both natural land cover 
uh, and anthropogenic uses of land uh, for different economic activities. And we can see this, this aggregation uh, in the final or right hand column of the table. And here we see this information uh, mapped out. The left map shows the, the distribution of these different uh, land cover classes uh, for, for 2015 uh, mapped out for Uganda. Uh, and on the right, we see uh, the map where we've, we've aggregated these land cover classes uh, to represent natural land use. So these are the, the blue areas on the map um, and also uh, uh, anthropogenic uh, uses of land. And so we can use this disaggregated map to understand uh, the implications of different land use decisions on that natural ecosystems uh, and potentially the services that they can provide. In order to achieve, achieve this, we made use of uh, a map of the uh, original vegetation in Uganda. So this was under sort of natural conditions before any land use change uh, had happened. And this allowed us to uh, uh, get to what the original distribution of ecosystems um, in Uganda uh, was, were uh, and where uh, suitable habitat uh, for associated uh, potentially economically important species uh, in Uganda might be found. So the map here uh, on the left presents four natural biomes, wetland, moist savanna, forest and dry savanna. Uh, and these can also be disaggregated further into 22 different uh, vegetation classes and we, we term these uh, ecosystems uh, in this approach. So what we've done is created accounts of the extent of each of these ecosystem areas um, uh, within uh, remaining areas of natural land cover for the different periods that we have uh, uh, observations of, of land cover for so 2000, uh, so from 1990, 2005, 2010 and 2015. Uh, we've then used expert knowledge to link these uh, natural ecosystems uh, with important non-timber forest products and then cover types with iconic species uh, that could support wildlife watching tourism. And this is the uh, diagram on the, on the right hand side is demonstrating the approach for this. So the analysis is around natural ecosystems as natural capital that provides a flow of ecosystem services that potentially contribute to economic activity. And I think this kind of accounting approach speaks very well to some of the OECD green growth indicators that the Katia uh, just identified. So using this approach, we were able to generate maps of, of the natural areas uh, where shear butter nut harvesting um, could potentially uh, take place uh, and where suitable uh, habitat for chimpanzees uh, uh, could exist that could uh, uh, support wildlife watching uh, tourism opportunities. So in the map on, on the left, the red areas show uh, where, where shear butternut harvesting could, could take place. And on the map on the right, uh, the green areas show areas uh, suitable for, for chimpanzees. And so we, we compiled uh, accounts uh, of the extent of the, these areas uh, of suitable habitat for these um, these ecosystem services uh, and we did this first at, at a national scale um, but we also compiled uh, accounts at, at the sub-regional scale uh, and furthermore by obtaining um, information on the extent of protected areas we we're also able to produce accounts uh, for the protected area system um, in Uganda. So now I'd just like to present some of the, the main findings uh, from, the, uh, from the work that we did. And here is an example of the extent of, of natural ecosystems. And this is for, for Uganda as a whole for the period uh, 2010 through to 2015. And we generated similar accounts uh, for, for other periods uh, as well. And so here we see a reduction um, in the extent of, of all natural uh, biomes over the period uh, and a commensurate uh, increase in, in non-natural uh, land cover uh, and that, that's highlighted by this, this pink box. Now this is a relatively simple example but it really drives uh, a fundamental ambition uh, of this work to present a picture not only of the changes in the stocks which we're referring to as, uh, uh, as areas 
uh, but also uh, paint a picture of the interactions between uh, the economy and the environment. And so here we can see how economic decisions on land use have impacted on natural ecosystems. And in the next account, we'll look at this interaction uh, from the perspective of uh, economic opportunities that could be associated uh, uh, with natural ecosystems. So with respect to the two ecosystem services of, of interest, first we look at the uh, potential for shear nut uh, provision. Uh, and so this uh, account here uh, presents information uh, by sub-region, uh, which is aggregated uh, to the national scale in, in the final column of the, of the account. Uh, and the account represents the period from 1990 to 2015. Uh, and what we see here is the potential for shear uh, button-up provisioning services uh, remains good um, in the Karamajoa uh, sub-region. Uh, and this is, this is shown by the, the, the green ovals um, on the account. Uh, and a lot of this potential uh, area uh, for, for shear butternut harvesting is not in, con in conflict uh, with the protected air as a state. So this suggests that Karamajoa can support combined conservation uh, development opportunities uh, associated with the sustainable harvesting uh, of this product. Um, however, uh, land use change uh, we can see has substantially reduced the potential uh, for shear nut uh, butter provisioning in, in Teso. Uh, as you can see from the red oval here, uh, only around 15% of the original uh, existing area uh, remains uh, for, for harvesting. Uh, second, uh, for iconic wildlife species and uh, potential tourism opportunities, uh, this account uh, shows the extent uh, of changes in suitable habitat for, for chimpanzees uh, by sub-region uh, between 2005 uh, and 2015, and again, this is aggregated to the national scale in, in, in the final column. And the account shows a small positive change in the extent of fully suitable habitat for chimpanzees in southwestern. So this is green oval, uh, with a majority of this habitat uh, covered by the protected areas of state. And we can see this from the, the bottom uh, green oval. Uh, and so this is indicating that the protected area of state is performing well uh, and could support wildlife uh, tourist watching opportunities in this uh, in this sub region. Um, however, we see some uh, uh, losses in fully suitable habitat uh, in the western sub region, uh, the red oval, uh, and there is the potential to, to expand the protected area of state in this sub region uh, to help secure uh, these potential wildlife watching opportunities in the future. So I'd just like to finish with some insights from this work uh, and a couple of caveats uh, and next steps. So potentially there are multiple economic benefits that can be realized from natural landscapes. Uh, and I just wanted to put some, some very uh, rough uh, figures on these. So for shear butternut harvesting, uh, and shear uh, butter production yields could uh, uh, equate to around $200 or, or $500 per hectare. Um, for wildlife watching by international tourists, the World Tourism Organization identifies individuals may spend in the region of $400 uh, per day in country in Africa when, when participating in this activity. So understanding where these benefits can be realized can, can help in land use decision making. Uh, it can help identify where conservation uh, and development co-benefits exist. Um, and this, in turn, uh, can help decision makers across ministries and sectors target investment in maintaining, improving, and also accessing uh, the benefits that natural capital uh, can provide. So uh, from my perspective, there's really a, a story here of, uh, of opportunity. Um, it's not just a, a case of uh, conservation. And I think this is very relevant to, to the idea of green growth uh, and also fits very well with uh, what is envisioned under Uganda's national development policy uh, as well as its national biodiversity strategy and action plan uh, and also speaks uh, to the sustainable development goals uh, in general. 
So just as a, a final slide here, uh, I wanted to just identify that uh, we have approached the accounting process uh, with a strong focus on natural ecosystems. Uh, and these uh, accounts have been uh, rapidly compiled using, using readily uh, available information. So they remain uh, subject to, to a future uh, uh, validation. Um, as this approach is, is very much uh, based on the use of remote uh, sense data, um, this makes it relatively uh, straightforward to, to complete, but would obviously benefit from, from additional uh, primary monitoring uh, data. Um, this is the, the first stage uh, in the process, we hope. We need to expand the coverage of the accounts, uh, particularly into uh, managed uh, and water ecosystems. And we also need to uh, consider a wider range of, of relevant ecosystem services uh, in this framework. Uh, but this is uh, establishing a fundamental spatial uh, infrastructure and foundation to, to take this type of uh, accounting uh, forward. And as we develop this work, uh, we can begin to integrate different natural capital data sets, uh, ecosystem services and benefits, and really start to communicate a more coherent picture of the interaction between uh, the environment and the economy uh, decision makers, to decision makers. Uh, and we, we really hope that this can uh, help uh, steer uh, land use decision making and development onto a sustainable path. So with that, I thank you very much for your uh, attention and uh, I will uh, attempt to pass the uh, presentation back. And uh, I think uh, we are moving forward. Uh, we have drawn some very good lessons from that experience in Uganda. Allow me now to invite uh, Eon Sinot, who will uh, make a presentation on uh, optimizing ecological and built infrastructure industries and cities. Uh, welcome, Eon. Thank you. Eon, please welcome. Thank you. Um, can you see me, Alice? Yes, I can see Steven. I can see you. Okay, one moment. Okay, there you come. Very good, okay. And the presentation's up, is that right? The presentation is up, yeah, but now we can see you. Please, most welcome, thank you. Okay, thank you, Alice. Thank you also to, uh, to Steven and uh, Katia. I think they've set the scene very, very clearly. I'm gonna share some reflections from Mozambique's green economy journey and the National Natural Capital Program, which is a program of the government of Mozambique, it's part of that journey, um, and it's in its inception phase. So it is to be developed, to be rolled out, um, and it's being implemented in partnership with the African Development Bank, um, WWF, and a number of other players. And I must say that there, are, there have been many actors along the way that have moved the broad green blue economy agenda forward in Mozambique, including UNEP, UNDP, and others. To set the scene, I'd like to share a quote that I heard the Minister for Land, Environment, and Rural Development uh, say while he was in New York on the sidelines of the SDG summit um, in September, so some uh, the same month uh, in 2015. He said on, on live TV following a partnership meeting with uh, the African Development Bank and WBF, live TV to the, the nation of Mozambique, um, that natural capital is Mozambique's greatest asset. And I think that's the framing, um, the framing fact that uh, gave rise to the natural capital program in, in Mozambique. Um, but what's the problem that uh, the natural capital program is, uh, is addressing? Why does it arise? And I think one of the, uh, the key factors is how we measure uh, the, the narrative of progress, how we determine where we're going as a society and as, as economies and as businesses. Um, and right now, the, one of the most cited uh, measures is GDP. And um, economies that are growing and that have a high rate of uh, GDP growth are deemed to be doing well. But that masks a lot of uh, complexities and tells only a small part of the story because GDP only measures output. It doesn't tell you about the underlying wealth or resilience um, of ecosystems, um, of society, of businesses. Even uh, the founding father of the architect, you could say, of this concept, Simon Kuznets, said the same. GDP does not help us measure the welfare of society. So 
when I think of GDP, I think it's, it's, it's essentially driving a global depletion project of natural capital. Um, there's many stats out there, but one simple example is to look at global fisheries, which are 80% uh, fully um, or overexploited. And that's disastrous. That's a, a big problem. So how do we go forward? How do we deliver the SDGs and what are we going to measure uh, to get there? Um, again, looking at some stats, a report released by Oxfam earlier this year showed that just eight men, not women, eight men, um, own as much as the poorest half of the world. GDP is not going to help us solve that inequality challenge. So the mindset that we need, need to move towards has been, has been a, very well framed, I think, by the Stockholm Resilience Centre and others um, as a social ecological systems mindset. That's the only way that we're going to move through uh, the uh, pressure points that we're now seeing. One very clear example is uh, climate change, um, and there have been terrible impacts hammering uh, the US in, in uh, recent weeks. I think many of us have followed. And the green growth uh, narrative, uh, the circular economy narrative, the green economy narrative, they're all um, looking beyond GDP and looking to the, the natural resource base, natural capital that is, or nature, which will help us deliver on, on the SDGs. Um, it's clear though, uh, and this is now I'm going to borrow words again from uh, another luminary, luminary in the natural capital space, Gretchen Daly of Stanford University, that there is a, a, a renaissance uh, underway, a renaissance around the world where we are increasingly recognizing um, that there are problems, and um, there are problems in delivering uh, this narrative of uh, the SDGs, sustainable development, that are largely uh, attached to the fact that we've been operating many economies and businesses as if on an infinite planet. Um, whereas we only have one, and we're breaching many planetary boundaries. So where are we in the world? Um, you can see here Mozambique is, is highlighted, but there are many other countries, I think, that are on this journey together with Mozambique in Africa and in other parts of the world, including in uh, Myanmar, um, in the Arctic, uh, in Colombia, to name some, uh, just some limited places. Mozambique has picked um, two provinces, Nyasa and Cabo Delgado to be the startup provinces, the phase one provinces for the natural capital program. So we're moving into uh, the research phase in the natural capital program. And Yasu and Cabo Gado are, uh, they, they cover an enormous area and cover various different types of ecosystems and, and offer many different opportunities and challenges um, for sustainable development. One of the great opportunities is certainly uh, off the shore of Palma, a small coastal town, and um, where we expect to see an enormous industrial complex for processing of uh, natural gas to grow, um, and there are a long, long list of international uh, extractive industry companies operating there, um, and Palma is the home to the fourth largest natural gas reserves in the world. So what will we use the natural gas revenues to invest in? And um, that's one of the big questions that the Natural Capital Program, I guess, along with the other opportunities we have out there, um, is grappling with. And a case in point on the, the subject of GDP not necessarily telling us whether we're going in the right direction is to look at Mozambique's own GDP story. So from the decade of 2005 to 2015, the average uh, GDP growth rate was 7%. But people living below the poverty line between 2003 and 2015, there wasn't a huge impact on that. So people living below the poverty line in 2003 were 52.8% of the entire population it dropped to 46% of the population in uh, 2015. So the Natural Capital Program is grappling with some of these challenges, and I'm going to zoom into the, the context around Palma to give a little example of um, the questions that are being asked by the Natural Capital Program. Um, how can we deliver lasting economic transformation? Um, economic development is much more complex than a sector focus, and the Natural Capital Program is trying to bring together all of the different sectors tell that story. And on the, the image here on the screen, you can see around Palma and the time of 2001. And if we come up to 2015, you can see that deforestation has accelerated and, and impacted a much larger area of natural forest. And what are the impacts beyond losing the standing tree itself? There are a number of livelihoods, of course, that depend directly on non forest products, but there are also numerous uh, services which are vital. I'm going to kill, excuse me, including um, 
uh, soil erosion. So when a forest is lost, we're, we're going to see an increased rate of soil erosion um, and uh, climate regulation and uh, water flow, the sedimentation retention that, retention that typically forest services provide. Yeah. So these are one of the big challenges that uh, the natural capital program is looking at. Another um, aspect of the natural capital program is to try and learn from other parts of the world um, on how we can improve uh, on the lessons that have been learned, for example, in, um, uh, in Houston, Texas, where there has been enormous uh, impact from Hurricane Harvey. And Mozambique does not want to arrive there, and though uh, Palma is a place that will grow off a natural gas industry, it's not this future that Mozambique wants to, uh, wants to deliver. So another big aspect of the natural program is natural capital programs. How do we invest in young entrepreneurs for a resilient future society? How can we help the future businesses that will grow and create those jobs that are desperately needed and so that they're well aligned with the natural world and don't deplete natural capital stocks so we can have a resilient uh, society of the future. And if you look at the natural gas revenues projections um, that will be delivered from uh, the gas fields off Palma, you can see in the late, uh, the mid 20s, early 2020s, that the revenues will begin to uh, increase. And so what will we invest those uh, revenues in? And much of the narrative of, uh, of uh, sustainable development in Mozambique centers around industrialization and the expansion of basic uh, human services and the expansion of built infrastructure. And uh, society will become largely urbanized in Mozambique. So how do we align uh, investments in these built infrastructures together with ecological infrastructures to sustain so services for society over time? Zooming into the landscape, one of the big policy entry points I've alluded to is built infrastructure. And we're working with uh, the government, uh, that is AFDB and WF, to consider how investments in infrastructure corridors can be better designed to align with ecological infrastructure to deliver those lasting benefits. So one example is the Lishinga Pemba corridor, which is an east-west uh, infrastructure corridor. And um, that, that, uh, uh, that line of infrastructure already exists, it will be upgraded. But the next step then is to build feeder roads uh, and irrigation projects, for example, to expand agriculture. But where do we put the dams? And um, where do we put the irrigation projects? And where do we build feeder roads to maximize benefits over a much longer period of time and, and the enormous challenge that climate change presents? Another corridor in the, the land which will be part of the first area of a policy program is the Mtwara Palma Pema Corridor, which links into Tanzania in the north. There's a policy uh, context that brought Mozambique to this point today. And the very first document that moved Mozambique onto the green economy um, pathway was a green economy roadmap launched in uh, Rio in 2012 by the president of the Republic of Mozambique, together with uh, the president of the African Development Bank and uh, the director general of WWF. And the vision set out in uh, the roadmap and um, highlights quite clearly that sustainable development won't be delivered without a good rational use of natural capital so that we can guarantee development within planetary uh, limits. What followed the roadmap was a much more uh, sector specific green economy action plan. And that seeded the very first um, clear indication for the need for something like what we have today, which is a natural capital program. And the Green Economy Action Plan influenced heavily the current government's five-year plan. And under the fifth priority of that plan, it highlighted the need for transparent and sustainable management of natural resources. And there indicated the need, once again, for an uh, initiative like the Natural Capital Programme to capture the value of nature in decisions. And in 2016 began the work of the government, driven by the Green Blue Economy Group, which is co-hosted, co-chaired rather, by the Ministry of Economy and Finance, together with the Ministry of Land, Environment, and World Development. Um, and the, uh, the Natural Capital Program was um, endorsed, uh, as I alluded to, by um, a number of partners that came together on the sidelines of the SDGs in, uh, in September in New York. Um, so high-level uh, high champions are key to move an initiative forward like this, um, and it must be multi-sector, but equally important, and. Uh, in the, in the doing of the work, um, genuinely where, the, where the, uh, the power must be, is that technical level of national directors and their teams. They are the ones that will deliver. And in this image on the bottom right of the screen, you can see um, the provincial directors from the Ministry of Economy and Finance and the Ministry of Land, Environment, and Rural Development. 
together with other line ministries from public works and water resources, agriculture and food security, energy and mineral resources, all coming together in Maputo for a planning session around the uh, development of the National Natural Capital Program. So the Natural Capital Program's goal, in essence, is to drive um, society towards inclusive, uh, productive and resilient systems. And the, uh, the three impact areas of the program are cross-cutting and uh, complex to manage, but uh, these are the areas that the, the government has identified. And there's first and foremost, inclusive prosperity. So with that human well-being, there, there will be no progress. And following that economic productivity, and last but not least, climate resilience. And I, I explained earlier that the likely entry points uh, for the Natural Capital Program will focus on the design of uh, new built and the alignment of that built infrastructure with the energy charge. The categories of natural capital the government has selected for management under the Natural Capital Program to be in, in, integrated under what's been called a resilient ecological infrastructure network include soils, fresh water, ocean systems, and renewable energy, and forests. And, and the, the approach of the Natural Capital Program is to identify service areas from which uh, benefits flow uh, from these uh, stocks of natural capital. And again, the challenge will be to design uh, this resilient ecological infrastructure network to manage that spatially explicit um, map of critical service areas of natural capital under a changing climate. So it will be inherently dynamic. I'm going to look at one example uh, of the, the narrative of ecological infrastructure and built infrastructure. And uh, we come down to the south of Mozambique to Maputo City, the capital. And you can see in the map there on the, the area highlighted, that's the catchment that serves the Maputo Reservoir. And the reservoir is what, of course, supplies water to the city. And let's call that the, the why of, the, of the, uh, the equation. And I was speaking to, uh, only last week, a, a big drinks manufacturer in the city of Maputo about what they consider to be one of the greatest threats to their own viability of their business, and that is water scarcity. And they are working with the, um, the municipality and the water utility to address leakage within the system. So 35 to 40% is the estimate they were working with of leakage of pipes of fresh water within the system. But we raised in discussion and um, uh, further upstream of the dam, the other uh, element of the equation of uh, infrastructure, and that is ecological infrastructure, that actually provides services to the dam to ensure that that dam uh, has water over a long period of time. And uh, looking in the catchment, you can see there's an area here called Bongolo. It's a forested part of the catchment. Let's call that the X of the equation. And Bongolo forest is part of the ecological infrastructure that supports rainfall, water, and sediment retention. So the dam currently, uh, the Maputo Reservoir, is currently uh, full of silt uh, to the point of 35%, which means 65% of the uh, capacity of dam is, that, is all that's currently available. And so the drinks manufacturer of this business thought that was a very interesting uh, topic and something to, uh, to look into further to address together. And there's an example from Kenya, Nairobi, of a water fund that the uh, Nature Conservancy, together with other partners, has helped develop with one of the utilities. And it's uh, attached to the Tana River um, Basin. And there they're trying to manage the ecological infrastructure upstream of the dam to ensure the dam doesn't end up full of uh, silt to provide more water and better quality of water to the users downstream, including uh, regular households, but as well as businesses. And the return on investment for the conservation uh, investment in ecological infrastructure estimated for the Tana River Water Fund, and um, they will put down uh, the estimate $10 million, and that will deliver up to $21 million uh, uh, in dollars of benefits over a 30 year period. So it's this type of approach that uh, Mozambique is, is uh, embarking on uh, to integrate and optimize ecological and built infrastructure under a changing climate. That's going to be our, 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 our huge challenge, I think. So the marrying of the X and the Y, the ecological and built infrastructure is the, uh, the goal of the Natural Capital Program. And we're working with the Council of Scientific and Industrial Research in South Africa and to conduct um, uh, some of the research in Mozambique through a national research group. And they've got great experience in uh, mapping strategic water areas, which have been uh, uh, integrated by the Department of Water in South Africa as ecological infrastructure in their own planning processes. And you can 
see from this map that, uh, or from the data rather, this map uh, is based on, that over 50% of the entire rainfall of South Africa falls in only 8% of the surface area of the country. So the Department of Water uh, Management in South Africa is now setting out to try and get all of those areas under management schemes. So industrialization and urbanization and the narrative of sustainable development in Mozambique and Africa and the world at large, it can be delivered um, if we integrate well with the different elements of natural capital that are vital to deliver those benefits over time. Um, but to do so, we'll need to adopt a whole new approach to how we manage business and how we manage society and how we manage the natural world. And it's going to have to be much more adaptive than it has been in the past um, to remain, uh, remain healthy and prosperous under a changing climate. So uh, the direction in Mozambique is the, the marrying of these two elements and then in the next steps and um, are briefly outlined here but we're, the very first step we're, uh, we're going to undertake are assessments I guess similar to like the work that has been done in uh, Uganda and some of the areas of work that uh, Katia has alluded to and uh, I look forward to sharing more experiences with everyone and I'm sure we can share slides and exchange Uh, later. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Aon. I think uh, at some point uh, I was losing you, but I'm sure we listened to most of the presentation. Uh, you have now moved us from uh, research on measurement methods and uh, indicators to policy dimension. I think at this point uh, we will uh, move on to the panel discussion and uh, we will look at uh, some three initial questions to you know to get us going. Uh, from the three presentations we learned that yes there is need to focus on how we manage our natural capital to ensure that we are able to decouple development from uh, uh, environmental sustainability. So a, a key question we can ask ourselves is why should African countries mainstream natural capital accounting into green growth policies? We are all moving green growth. We take note that uh, Mozambique, for example, had its green growth blueprint uh, launched in 2012. But uh, we, we want to, 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 to understand why should we take into account the natural capital accounting. Uh, beyond that, we would also want to know how can African countries accelerate the integration of natural capital accounting into the paradigm of green growth with a focus on enhanced human and environmental well-being. It was very interesting that uh, Ian challenged the, the value of GDP as a measurement of growth and development. And that narrative is coming so much into the mainstream economic analysis and well-being analysis. Do we have alternative measure uh, beyond GDP? And the third question we can ask ourselves is the so what question. So what if the target impacts of mainstreaming climate uh, I mean, natural capital accounting in green growth uh, has been undertaken by governments. You know, we would be wanting to see what are the impacts of natural uh, capital accounting. So uh, these are many, among other questions. Uh, we have had a very active audience and during registration, we had uh, many questions already which were streaming in uh, at the start of the discussions, we had 22 questions, a uh, number of them touching on uh, people wanting to know what are the best practices, some are looking at what are the business options, uh, how do we finance natural capital accounting, the geographical spread of the discussions, the role of government, and lots and lots of questions on methodology, which tells us that we still have a lot to learn as we uh, move on with the a conversation on uh, embedding or uh, bringing in natural capital into our green growth policies. At this point, uh, allow me 
dear participants to open our uh, webinar for uh, a panel discussion. The panelists, you were, we are inviting uh, comments uh, also on those three questions. Uh, and I'm inviting um, the three of you, uh, anyone wanting to bring on board knowledge on the three background questions. Stephen, I see you. Welcome. Hello. And I'm not, I'm not my own. Okay. Have we um, lost Ian? Hello? Oh, great. Now we are set. And uh, please uh, let us uh, move on to this session on panel discussion. As you may realize, we also have a very, very tight time frame for this. And we have only 10 minutes. So as much as possible, we want to share. So you are welcome to engage. Um, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll start as I'm uh, <laughs> open my webcam. Um, yeah, I mean, it, this obviously is an... Uh, 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 these questions aren't particular to African countries, uh, they're, they're particular uh, to us all. Um, and it's uh, this idea of mainstreaming uh, natural capital uh, into gro green growth is, you know, equally applicable uh, to, to many country uh, contexts. I think reflecting on the, you know, the first sort of why uh, question, I mean, uh, from my perspective, I feel that failure to account for, for natural capital is uh, not going to support a, a long-term economic development at some point. The dependency uh, that we all have on natural capital is, is, is going to bite if we don't uh, maintain it and, and manage it appropriately. Um, and I think there's also this, this, this narrative around you know, opportunities uh, for better use of, of natural capital that we're not really making best use of uh, at the moment, be it for uh, water provision, uh, for sustainable harvesting uh, processes, for, for lots of other um, uh, opportunities. So, you know, I, I think mainstreaming really gets at this, this core of starting to unlock some of those, those potential opportunities. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Any other comment? Perhaps yeah. I can uh, try and respond to the second one. Yes, Katya, welcome. Thank you. Methodology. I'm sure you, are, you, are, you, are, you have all that answers about methodology, and we have lots of questions of how. Well, in terms of the how, I mean, I, I think it, it's a combination of uh, top-down and bottom-up approaches. Um, I think um, at, the, at the top level, it's important to try and uh, seize opportunities to try and uh, mainstream uh, natural capital in uh, green growth strategies, in um, development plans. So if there are revisions underway, if the environment ministries can prepare in advance to try and see what are the key priorities in the development aspects, um, if it's, uh, say, food or human health, then how, how to try and make uh, the environmental elements most relevant to the priorities um, in, the, in, the econ in the Ministry of Economy, etc. Uh, I think interministerial commissions uh, can be very useful to bring various stakeholders together across a number of sectors, um, as much interaction as possible, um, and also vertical, uh, vertical coordination, so from top down to regional and, and local levels. Um, so that's sort of more on the institutional um, elements. But in terms of uh, also practical, then how to actually integrate that, um, identifying priorities I think is important as unfortunately I think across all countries um, there's a lot of work that needs to go into these elements and it's helpful to understand well, what are the key pressures and how do you prioritize uh, sort of short and phase, you know, short term versus longer term um, how you want to address the issues, um, and then try and identify what what policies you can put in place, uh, whether they're uh, regulatory command and control approaches, whether they're more economic-based instruments, um, such as payments for ecosystem services, 
or uh, and uh, taxes on on harmful uh, on pollution, etc., to also voluntary measures, so uh, business partnerships, private public partnerships, etc. Um, so a very sort of comprehensive mix, trying to identify all the various entry points, trying to identify priorities, and then putting that into action, and monitoring progress as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you very much. Well, you know, when you may say it's very comprehensive, and some of us find it very complex, especially when it is uh, involving interministerial. And, and, and I think one of the questions which has come to us through the audience is, do we have concrete example of where this has worked? Any practical country that is showing the lead and telling us, yes, this is how we have uh, brought on board or uh, I think we are avoiding the word mainstreaming, uh, but this is how we have incorporated natural capital in our green growth policies and actions. I think we need to keep thinking about that, but uh, let me give the space to Eon also, if you have any, uh, I'm sure you have some insights to give us regarding these questions, any of them. Let me jump to the first one, the why. It's always the why I think is the most compelling. Um, mm -hmm. of any of these questions. Why are we doing it? I think if we don't, it's kind of like saying to everybody, here's a credit card. No, actually, let me give you two. No, actually, let me give you three credit cards. And you know what? I'm not going to give you a bank statement. You don't need to worry about it. Just go spend. That's kind of what we're doing right now across the world mm -hmm. as economies. The ones that, is, that are not measuring natural capital. And, and as Katya alluded to, in words of, of a uh, Pavan Sukta, another luminary in the space. You can't manage it if you're not measuring it. So I certainly would never give to my friend a credit card and say, go shopping, have fun, don't look at the bank statement, just mm -hmm. go shopping. Mm -hmm. It's insane. In a finite, finite world, it's insane. But it's stemming from a mindset of society which has grown, I think, so rapidly over the last hundred years that um, the mindset hasn't changed, but the number of people has from 1900, 1 billion, to today, 7 billion plus, and we're all consuming more, and we all want more. And so the why, I think, is, uh, for me, it's, it's quite fundamentally obvious that we, we can't operate without looking at a bank statement if we're going to give out credit cards. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for bringing out that uh, example of our being indebted to nature that the more we extract from nature, we are actually uh, creating a debt that we have to pay back. And that brings the sense as to why we must ensure that as we develop our green growth policies, we articulate the dimensions of uh, natural capital. We have any other comments from the panelists? But let's look at this bit of impact because whatever we do, uh, yes, we'll have methods of measurements. Yes, we'll know what to measure. And uh, yes, we'll incorporate into the policies. But the question of so what, we need to answer that. Because that is where we'll draw on concrete examples of this is how it has worked. Any, let's can share. I, can I jump on that? I referred to the, the close to home, uh, close to Alice's home in Nairobi. And um, there is a water fund, one of the first in Africa, that's been set up. Mm -hmm. and, and that water fund is looking at uh, water supply to users in, uh, in and around Nairobi City. And I think it's a wonderful, inspiring case of measuring the natural world, understanding the connections and the reactions and the feedback loops between different actions, and uh, coming up with a management regime that will improve the productivity of the ecological infrastructure over a longer period of time. So that water fund is going up into the catchment of the Tana River and investing in conservation measures to improve um, the performance of dams that supply the users downstream. And it's a good case of private sector, public sector coming together to address a very specific uh, challenge, which is water quality and uh, water scarcity. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. As uh, we are moving on, we would wish to engage with the audience and uh, give as much time to the audience. And at this point, I would want us to transition uh, to the questions that we have from the audience. And I would wish that um, if I get a question on board, 
uh, maybe uh, one of you comes in to help us respond to it. And uh, one of the questions that we have received uh, is asking us um, uh, how we apply the payment for ecosystem schemes and uh, any successful case studies that we, should, we, we, we have that we can share on the PES system. So maybe if I can uh, come in on this one, I think reflecting on the work uh, we've done around uh, forests, uh, particular and uh, ecosystem extent of those uh, natural capital assets. Um, the, the the obvious uh, case study that was bring to mind is is around uh, Red Plus uh, type uh, initiatives um, and the potential for those uh, really to uh, help secure um, those those global um, ecosystem services. Um, on a similar uh, vein, um, thinking of biodiversity as, as, a, as a natural capital uh, asset of, uh, of global significance, um, one would hope the, the direction uh, for, for global payments for, for preserving that as well could uh, be supported by um, these types of natural capital assessment uh, and, and accounting approaches. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Steve. Uh, here, the, the, the question here which we have is they would also want to get some specific successful case studies. And therefore, what is the indicator of success? Perhaps. Um, yes, Katia. Okay, I mean, I, overall, uh, worldwide, there are more than, I think, 300 PES programs around the world targeting various elements. And uh, we've done some work looking at how to enhance the environment environmental and the cost effectiveness of uh, payments for ecosystem services. Um, and some of the features of sort of uh, more successful PES programs, both from an environmental standpoint and a, and a cost effective standpoint, is to, for example, use the data, spatial mapping data, looking at the various types of ecosystem services, uh, where the, the benefits of those ecosystem services are highest. Uh, in terms of forests or, or water, um, and trying to first target those areas um, for payments where the, where the benefits are highest, and also um, looking at areas where there's highest threat. Because if you're making payments uh, to ecosystem service providers uh, where there is really no threat of loss, um, or there are no really major opportunities for enhancement, then making that payment in that particular area is not as valuable as making it elsewhere where there is about to be forest degradation or, or forest loss, etc. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one element, looking at areas with high benefits um, with the high costs. Yeah. All right, thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, what we are drawing, the lesson we are drawing there is that indeed there have been successful cases. Uh, maybe we have not created a, a big space for knowledge sharing on this, but definitely this provides an avenue for us to account for natural capital and its value in environmental and human well-being. Let us look at another question, which uh, one of our members in the audience uh, was asking is how can or uh, should the different levels of government work together to best facilitate green growth on the ground? Now, someone is saying that we might have policies, but now at the, the grassroots level, actual, we want practical action. But there are different players here. So how can different levels of government work together so that we can see green growth taking place on the ground? Um, may, I, yeah, cool. I, or Ion, did you want to give us some example from Madagascar? Well, from Mozambique, because I, I have Mozambique. some experience. Um, <laughs> I, I would say it's, it starts at the top and, and the action happens then on the ground. So having very high level political buy-in commitment is key. Um, and I think any country that's embarking on this kind of a mission has to invest in people. You've got to have staff, you've got to have a unit and that can actually take it on. And it's not a project. And um, this isn't something you like open and close in a couple of years. You're, you really have to transform the shape and form of government. And I think when line ministries develop their uh, 
their plans as they do on an annual basis and work together with government to develop typically uh, five-year programs. And it's all got to come through some sort of a bottleneck and which uh, typically will be managed by Ministry of Planning or Economy and Finance, where they can stress test those plans, add up all the individual projects and see cumulatively if they're going to operate within ecological limits of any one given system in any one given region. Um, so I, I've, I, I really think that the bottom line is it's not, none of these initiatives will go very far unless you build dedicated teams, teams that are, are become institutionally part of uh, the framework of government for, um, for eternity. This, is, this problem is never going to go away. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, just, I, uh, Steve, you wanted uh, yeah. this place, yes? Yeah, just uh, uh, something I think that's, that's related to that and this idea of being able to get to different levels of, of government. I think there's uh, some transaction cost here around um, natural capital information and by making natural capital uh, information available uh, and scalable um, uh, across different levels, whether it be a national uh, scale, a sub-regional scale, um, uh, a watershed, uh, or, or even uh, a local scale, uh, I think can really help to, to kickstart uh, the discussions between local choices that are made um, on the ground uh, and then the, the, the overarching uh, national scale uh, policies uh, towards natural capital uh, management. So th this idea of having some uh, scalable natural capital information system I think is really important to uh, really bring everyone into into the discussion. Thank you very much. Uh, Katia, you want to make a contribution to that question? No, I'll leave it for fine. another. Yes, yeah, but I think this is very important. Thank you, Steve and uh, Ian, for uh, making that contribution. What we are learning is that, yes, it is possible for the different levels of government together to work together on green growth and ensure that there is action on the ground. So long as, number one, uh, there is political will. Indeed, the political support is very necessary. Why? Our parliaments are the ones that approve budgets. And uh, with high level political engagement, we are able to mobilize resources at scale, financial, capital, and others. And that it has to be long term. It, as uh, Ian told us, it's not a one-off activity. It's a long term planning process with institutional teams that will take the, uh, the arrangement forward. And uh, that, I think, uh, is, is very, very uh, useful a lesson that we are drawing here. We also have a third question, which is uh, uh, we are being asked here by the audience uh, in terms of what are the methods and approaches for integrating the natural capital narrative into the larger growth and development agenda? I think this suits Katia very well. Uh, I'm volunteering you to respond to this first. Then we listen to Steve and Dion. Katia, please. Um, I think that uh, it's very helpful to identify the values of natural capital and how they feed into uh, national development. I mean, the, the basic problem is that a lot of the inherent values in natural capital are not reflected in our everyday transactions and market prices, and hence they're not reflected in GDP at the greater level, as um, Ion mentioned. Um, so, for example, what are the benefits of ecotourism uh, in uh, GDP? Um, what are the benefits of, or the costs also of soil erosion in the agricultural context? What are the costs of inaction? If you can uh, try and identify that, that information um, and to help make the case uh, at, the, at the national level as to why it's important uh, to factor that in um, and to make it transparent and to help make the case uh, for more sustainable uh, production and consumption methods. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Additional contributions? Uh, Steve? Uh, just, yeah, uh, I suppose one of the things is uh, time scales as well. Um, if planning's done over a short period, um, the, the benefits from natural capital won't stand out uh, as strongly as when uh, you're, you're looking over a, a longer period. So, you know, in the UK, there's a 25-year uh, plan for uh, natural capital, um, all the environment now. So, so taking, you know, uh, a longer time frame over to which to uh, consider your 
uh, growth and development plans uh, can also uh, really help to, to integrate the natural capital narrative. Mm -hmm. yeah. can I, yes, Katia, welcome. Can I just add one? I mean, I think it's also um, a very important element to consider is also the political economy aspects. So how do you actually make that transition to green growth? I mean, I think in a sense you can find uh, data or make the case that uh, you know we should be preserving more you know more sustainable agriculture, more sustainable water management, etc. But often uh, there are costs and benefits to different stakeholders, and also uh, in the long and short term. So how do you make that transition? Um, from, from one point in time to the next? Um, how can you provide uh, compensation to those that are adversely affected, for, to, the, to those that are uh, you know, poor and dependent uh, on these uh, existing, uh, on the status quo, et cetera? Um, yeah, so it's, it's bringing t these two different elements together, making the case and also trying to identify political economy challenges that might come up and how to try and overcome these. Okay, thank you very much. I think uh, we are making good progress, although time is not on our side, but I must emphasize that uh, on this aspect of methods and approaches, uh, we may need to do a little bit, a lot of more research and share a lot. As I said, we had 22 questions from the audience and six of which were touching on methodology. Uh, but there is another question that, uh, this is our last of the four questions that we selected for this uh, conversation is that what are the mechanisms for financing natural capital and how do corporations and other stakeholders engage? Mechanisms for financing, this is now we need the money for natural capital and how do corporations and other stakeholders engage? Oh, yes? <laughs> uh, <laughs> Can I start? Yes, please. Thank you. Okay, so obviously uh, finance is, is incredibly important and um, there are different uh, policy instruments that are available to help raise uh, finance. Um, these can include uh, taxes, uh, fees and charges, for example, user fees to protected areas, uh, taxes on uh, groundwater pollution, on air pollution, etc. Yeah, so that's that's one strand. Um, there also you can use, for example, uh, biodiversity offsetting mechanisms, looking at the mitigation hierarchy, where you uh, require uh, industry to offset um, some damages that uh, you can't avoid in one area. And one way you can do that is also ask them to pay into a fund, which generates finance, which then you can use to uh, compensate for protection elsewhere. There are um, other methods, uh, payments for ecosystem services is another method to generate finance and of course also the more traditional methods such as a government budget. So making the case, by making the case also as to why uh, natural capital has value, um, the real, the true value sort of, um, you can hopefully raise it up on the, on the government agenda and make the case for why more uh, government budget needs to be allocated to to, um, natural capital, and finally also ODA. Those are some of the methods to to finance uh, natural capital conservation and sustainable use. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I think the way oh. we see it now is, uh, is Steve. Did you want? To sorry, I just want to say quickly. Yes, Katya, you're welcome. I'm sorry, I just wanted to say that implicitly a number of these um, policy instruments, such as taxes, user fees, uh, biodiversity offsets. They engage um, the business sectors directly, so it's a it's a, it's one method to to raise uh, finance. Okay. Oh, uh, thank you Alice, very much. Alice, can I jump in? My, oh, sure. You're welcome. I'm um, sorry, the video connection not good on my end, so I dropped that. But um, there's a whole there's a whole other uh, uh, element to the story, and that's risk in and of itself. Businesses are looking to avoid risk. Um, in their investments, um, and I think revealing where those risks lie um, relative to different types of natural capital um, and resilience of the, the supply chains of any one business over time are very big, um, they're very big questions that businesses um, across the board from banks to uh, operators in particular sectors are very concerned about, especially that a particular resource may run out. 
And so that in of itself is also a huge um, huge incentive, I think, as Katya was alluding to, some of those mechanisms can be applied to. Okay. Thank you very much. Looks like we are running out of time for this conversation, but it was very interesting. I think uh, businesses have got a huge opportunity to, uh, to engage in green growth through public-private partnerships and also through marketing mechanisms like eco-labeling uh, that makes uh, them profile themselves as good business practitioners uh, because they pay attention to the natural capital and uh, demonstrating that indeed uh, the business is not just for profit, uh, but also to ensure that we have uh, social high social returns on investment. Uh, this has been, uh, I note that uh, we, we may be now out of time. I want to take the opportunity to thank all the panelists, uh, to thank uh, uh, Global Green Growth Platform for uh, creating this space for us to engage in this uh, conversation. I want to say that uh, it was very interesting. Uh, we have uh, taken note from the presentations, from the questions, uh, from the audience, and some which are still streaming in on the chat, uh, uh, chat window, that indeed there is a global concern on the need to incorporate natural capital accounting in national development policy. And this is particularly relevant for a continent like Africa, where rapid physical development, as we have seen uh, in, the, in the Palma region, uh, in terms of infrastructure and industrialization is leading to increased um, uh, intensified uh, extraction of uh, natural resources and uh, the resource base is dwindling, dwindling very, very fast indeed. Uh, we have uh, appreciated that uh, methods for bringing natural capital in development policy are being developed and the examples from OECD are uh, giving us sound lessons, as, uh, th as well as those ones from Uganda, the experimental uh, measurement uh, project. And uh, we are saying that uh, together with the indicators, uh, the associated measurement methods are being developed, but we also have a lot to learn from what has already been in place, like PES, with the 300 examples globally, uh, I think we are not doing very well. Uh, but we also take note that intensive uh, knowledge sharing is necessary and we do hope that uh, through a platform like uh, uh, GGKP, we should be having more and more opportunities like this one so that we are able to share uh, what we know. All this we are doing against a background and a backdrop of our commitment to sustainable development goals and the Paris Agreement, as well as other global environmental commitments through conventions and so on. Uh, and overall, we say that uh, through this uh, conversation and the examples that we have obtained, including uh, natural capital in green growth policy, is a long-term planning uh, initiative that should uh, be anchored on uh, political support, existence of uh, functioning uh, institutionalized teams, uh, so that uh, we are able to uh, move forward systematically uh, on this aspiration of greening our, our uh, development policies. We are able actually to decouple uh, development from uh, uh, environment, uh, sustainable management of the environment. I, I, at this point, uh, allow me to uh, get back to our convener so that uh, we are guided on the way forward. Thank you very much. And bye-bye. Uh, Steve, bye-bye. Katia, bye-bye. I have lost uh, Aeon, bye-bye, and uh, we will uh, be Thanks, able Alice. to continue touching. Thank you very much for your presentations. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank the speakers and Dr. Kaudia for joining us today. We thank the audience for joining us and sending your questions. Please look for what we've put online afterwards. It will be there within a day uh, if you'd like to review anything and, and uh, be sure to share it if you have the chance, and we'll see you next time. Thank you very much.